When the prophets talk about the, the orphan and the widow and the needy, and when Jesus talks about uh, the uh, people who suffer and the poor, it's not about the poverty. It's not about the suffering. It's not about the oppression. It's about how the human spirit responds to that. And, uh, you know, Hassan made reference to my own transformation, which I will talk about. My transformation from a, a Jew born in the United States in 1948, which means perforce uh, growing up as a Zionist, my transformation from someone who accepted, bought, and endorsed the Zionist narrative um, to someone who feels that unless we can overcome Zionism, uh, which has hijacked Judaism and which is killing Judaism, um, that transformation came about when I witnessed the occupation for the first time at, you know, as a middle-aged man, having lived in Israel and, and uh, and visited Israel many times, but never seen what was really going on. It didn't come from witnessing the occupation so much and from the confrontation with that evil. That was a big, big part of it. The real transformation for me and the real, um, the real miracle for me in terms of finally understanding who I am and what I'm supposed to do as a human being and as a Jew came from meeting the Palestinian people. And the real, I think what concerns me most of all is not what's happening to the Palestinians. The Palestinians, as you saw from Dr. Gobert's presentation, and as you see when you meet, when you go there and when you meet Palestinians here in this, in this country traveling, uh, I'm still too moved by what happened this morning. It's hard for me to, to remember what I was going to say. What I, my real concern is for the uh, Jewish people uh, who are living under those circumstances. It was seeing my Jewish cousins and nephews and nieces at those checkpoints doing what they had been taught to do and conditioned to do to those other human beings, it was seeing the look in their eyes and what's happening to their souls. Uh, listening again to, to Dr. Gilbert this morning, I was reminded of a story that I, that I sometimes tell and I will tell it, I'll tell it now. I was sitting in Ramallah in the West Bank and I was uh, meeting with a Palestinian woman who is the uh, country director of uh, an international NGO. Her name is Lana uh, Abu Hilja. She's from Nablus remarkable woman, doing remarkable work. And like any Palestinian, she has her own story. You know, she said, well, you know, I'm from Nablus. I said, well, tell me about your family. She said, well, my, my, my father and my brother were killed in cold blood by the IDF in a drive-by. I was sitting next to them. I was injured. She tells me the story, not for pity, not to complain, not out of bitterness, but simply to say, yes, you know, this is the exact same words that you heard from the doctor there. This is our life. I don't know how many times I heard that traveling through the West Bank from bus drivers and from, from farmers and people who you meet. Yes, this is our life. But then Alana told me another story, <clears throat> which I know she wanted me to spread around as much as possible. <laughs> She works in Ramallah, she lives in Jerusalem, and uh, every day she travels from North Jerusalem, which is still in the West Bank, this is part of it that's still left, travels to Ramallah, it's a five or six mile trip, it can take a long time depending on how the checkpoints are working that day. <clears throat> As you travel along that road, and those of you who've been there know this, you are accompanied the entire time by the wall. The wall is pretty much built around that area, and it's, you know, you've seen the pictures of the wall, and it's your, it's your companion as you travel up and down. She has her eight-year-old daughter with her, makes that trip with her often. 
And you know how eight-year-olds, every once in a while, they will just come out with something out of the blue that just sort of blows your mind. So her eight-year-old once, one day turns to her and says, Mommy, <clears throat> why do they make the Jews live behind that wall? And so, you know, this child does not know that she is the prisoner, she is the dispossessed one, this is happening to her, and her hand is being taken away. She knows, and she speaks the truth. <clears throat> We're still building those walls, and we still feel, you can't hear me? I can hike this up, all right, you guys are in control. All right, is that better, is it, is it okay? It's not, it's not too bad, all right. I don't have time, I don't want to go. The, the, the point is made. The point is made. Palestinians know who they are. They have not lost their dignity. <clears throat> Israelis don't know the Palestinian people. They're full of all kinds of ugly, racist, crazy ideas about who these people who are brothers and sisters are. It is a, it, it's a tragedy that I feel very, very, very deeply. Um, for myself and, and, and for my people. But you know, I, I want to stop talking about my people. <clears throat> my people, as you know, my, in, in my book, the, the very beginning of the book, I have two quotes. <clears throat> one is from, um, I think it's from Mark, or very early, chapter one, where, where Jesus is out there and he's begun his ministry and he's causing all kinds of trouble and he's being followed by thousands of people and he's, he's driving out demons evil spirits, and he's, you know, he's become a superstar. <clears throat> and the word comes back to his family, you know, you remember the story, the word comes back to his family, go get Jesus and bring him home, because he's really, he's getting us into a lot of trouble, and he's going to be in trouble, and it's not good, to, and he's really gone over the deep, you know, he's gone over the edge, bring him home. And so Jesus is sitting, and he's teaching, and he's ministering, and they, the, they come to him and say, your mother, and, and, and your your brother and your sister are outside and they want you to come home. And Jesus, remember what he says, is, who are my mother and my brother and my sister? All who follow the, the word of God. Those are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. And fast forward 2,000 years to Tel Aviv. <clears throat> and Nurit um, El, uh, Elhanan, whose daughter was killed in a suicide bombing. She's a Jewish Israeli whose daughter was killed in a suicide bombing in uh, uh, several years before. And she's become a big activist, and her husband and she started the, the, the family circle where they meet with Palestinian families who have also lost children to the conflict. And she tells the story in this speech to, to the women in black in Tel Aviv. And she said, you know, after our daughter was killed, we opened our house of mourning. And uh, Israelis came, Palestinians came, lots of people came. And uh, someone asked me, <clears throat> how can you open your house to the enemy? I'm talking about the Palestinians. How could you let them into your house? And she said, I didn't let them in. When Netanyahu, who was the uh, prime minister at the time, sent his people to our house of mourning, to our shiva house, I wouldn't let them in. My enemy. My enemies are the people who make war from both sides. My brothers and sisters are like me, the people who want peace, and who, like me, could not protect our children from the conflict. Those are my enemies. Those are the war criminals. So when I tell you, say my people, I'm not talking about the Jewish people or the Tanta. I'm talking about those of us, those of us around the world who are working for a justice and who know who the enemies of that are. So we're here to talk about theology. Okay, so we really want to talk about theology because, you know, as it's been said before, it's been said here, this is not a religious struggle. Okay, this is a struggle about dignity and about water and about land and about, and, and about human rights. It is, however, very, very much an issue of faith because what people believe is important. And how people understand their faith and what their faith requires of them 
is important. And politics have failed to bring about peace. You know, we talk about the peace process. And I'll come back to that at the end when I talk about changing the wind and what we need to do politically. The process that will bring peace is much, much more like the process that brought about the end of Jim Crow America and that brought down the apartheid regime in South Africa. It's about a grassroots movement. And the voices that will bring about peace will not be Obama or Mitchell or Netanyahu or Abbas or the politicians. It will be voices like Amos and Hosea and Isaiah and Jesus of Nazareth who speak that truth and who rouse people. It's, these are prophetic times and they are urgent times. The talk this morning reminded me once again about how urgent this is and why we don't have time. And so we need, I mean, we need to, we need to remember Martin Luther King. One, if I had had a chance to ask a question this morning of the speakers that we just heard talking about religious extremism, it would have been this. Remember what MLK said? And I think it was in the Birmingham jail letter. He said, I'm much, much more worried about the white liberals than I am about the Ku Klux Klan. And I think it's really important. We have to understand how the religious extremisms, the extremists, especially in the case of Israel, are the tail wagging the dog. And we have to be concerned about religious extremists here in the United States that have significant political and economic power, but it can't distract us from the Zionism and the exceptionalism that's hiding in plain sight in the mainstream. That's where the grassroots is going to come from, the, the, the movement that's going to come, that's going to change the political wind and make a difference in terms of what kind of political settlement is going to happen. And uh, what I want to talk about today is what I feel is one missing piece to that. What is a major barrier to that movement growing here in the United States, and I really want to issue a call to the church. And I want to talk about what has happened here, in this country in particular, since the Second World War, and why we have to get beyond what we have come to call interfaith dialogue. Because I believe that interfaith dialogue has really become a trap. And we need to be liberated from that. So as I said, I was born in 1948. If you're a Jewish kid born in 1948 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, you were raised in a potent combination of rabbinic Judaism and political Zionism. We prayed to the state of Israel three times a day, the first flowering of our redemption. We're not talking Zion, we're not talking about Jerusalem, the state of Israel. I was told that I had been blessed to have been born at a time when my people had been redeemed from the suffering of millennia. And it was a tale of heroism, and it was a tale of bravery. And that's the narrative. That's the Zionist narrative. And you know, even after I had lived in Israel, and even after I had, I had seen that, understood that my kibbutz actually was an atrocity site, and after I learned from Palestinians that I met that Golda had destroyed their village, you know, Golda, my Golda, is a war criminal? You know, I knew that the occupation was wrong, and I knew that it was a problem, but I still held to the Zionist narrative. You know, this is the price of security, because I still hadn't seen it. When I finally went to see it, and I thought I was on the left, what I found that was, what I thought was left was uh, somewhere right of center. You know, when you are confronted with the horror, it really, it really changes you. I came back, and I made several discoveries. One was that the doors of the synagogues were closed to me. Now I understand that it is starting to change. There's something happening here, right here in the Bay Area. Here and there, little points of light are starting. 